My name's Mark, not Mike. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they, called, they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Second one is Revelations 4, 6 through 8. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center, around the throne, there were four living creatures, and they cover, were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was a, like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do praise your name, for you are holy. Lord, we cannot even fathom what that means. We thank you and praise you that you would create us, that you would create us in your own image, that you would desire a relationship with us, that even though we're a stick neff rebellious people who cannot keep your law, who don't desire to even keep it so many times, Lord, you would send your son to be an atonement for our sins. That he would give up heaven, that he would be submissive, a humble servant to the ones that we, he created. And that he would willingly lay down his life to save his sheep. Lord, may we be sheep that follow the voice of only Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Lord, we pray today that you open our eyes, you open our minds, our hearts to hear your word. Lord, our, your word are written on our hearts, Lord. Let us be in tune with the Spirit. Let us walk with the Spirit. Let us not live for our own will and our own desires, but live for your will, Lord, and your kingdom. May your kingdom come, Lord, and we just thank you for the privilege of being those who bring the kingdom in by being the saints that you have called us to be. Lord, sanctify us through and through with your word and through, with your spirit, Lord, and we just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. What do you think of when you... Hear or read, holy, holy, holy. What do you think of? I said in my prayer, I cannot even begin to fathom, and I thought about that a lot this week. I can't think to fathom about the holiness of God. As we're reading Hebrews, you should think about that, and then you've started reading James, and you'll be reading Ephesians this week. And be sure you get a calendar, because it's going to depart from the normal scriptures on the Holy Week. Um, and we're going to be looking at some more Old Testament scriptures. And I urge you when you're reading through the New Testament and there's references to the Old Testament, go back and read that. And that's why I gave the pamphlets out. And if you didn't get a pamphlet, if you weren't here last week, be sure to see me and get one. They gave the tabernacle design and explained a little more there and everything because the author of Hebrews is writing to Hebrews. He's writing to Israelites. And they know a lot of this. A lot of this has been distorted because of a tradition and stuff. And I use the example of did George Washington really cut down the cherry tree? We don't know. His dad knew if he was in that tree. I've heard that joke before. Have you ever heard that? You know? But we don't know who Melchizedek was. We look at legends and myths and everything else. We don't know what the people of that day actually thought about some of these things. But they were familiar with them. We're not even familiar with some of this. And they were familiar with God's holiness. It had been a part of their past and everything. And that's why they wrote the laws on the doorposts of their houses. And that's why they had the celebrations and the festivals. And still the sacrifices going on in Jesus' day. Because God is holy, holy, holy. And we are sinners, sinners, sinners. 
But yet He still wants a relationship with us. He desires a relationship with us. And He has called us through the precious blood of Jesus Christ to be His children. To not only be His children, but to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Holy, holy, holy. The Hebrew word for holy is kadoshe. I don't know if I said it right or not. Close enough that... He, he understood it. That's why I look over that way to see Walt. He studied Hebrew and he, he knows it quite well. It's used for God, of course, but it's also used for the saints. It literally means sacred, set apart. We're not of this world. We belong to God. We were created in His image we were restored back to a right relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, if that is your case. In Exodus 19, 6, you'll see the first time that that word is used in the Old Testament. And it's not used for God, it's used for His people. You will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That should just make you think of the New Testament verses that echo the same words. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Learn from their examples, as Paul writes, as the author of Hebrews is writing, as Peter writes, as James writes. Learn from their examples. They were a stiff-necked, rebellious people. But God still made covenants, made promises with them. He's still faithful. And through the Israelites, the world will be blessed, Abraham's descendants. And through the Israelites came Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the one who was slain for our sins. The Greek word is hagios. It's used for God again, for saints. It means sacred and set apart. And a lot of times the Greek words and the Hebrew words mean quite different things. But in this case, they mean pretty much the same thing. The most common use of the word holy, you can guess it in the New Testament, is Holy Spirit. Because that was foreign to the Israelites unless the Holy Spirit came upon somebody for a little bit and he prophesied or whatever reason it was. But we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, tabernacle or tabernacling or dwelling with us if we are in fact His children. Do you realize how holy you are to God? How set apart you are for His service? The price that you've been redeemed by with the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God who is God, but did not consider equality with God anything to be used for His advantage, but instead humbly lay down His life to save you. In Ephesians, you're going to start reading Ephesians this week, and you'll see that word used quite often. Paul writes to the church in Ephesus to let them know how great a salvation that they had, who they were in God, the life that they were going to live, and they were going to fight a spiritual battle, and they need to put on God's armor to be able to fight that. But the victory has already been won in Jesus Christ. So stand firm in all that you do, and it teaches submission again, because even Christ was submit submissive. It teaches salvation by faith, not by works. And you are the children of God that He has intended you to be from the, cre from the beginning of creation. You are His masterpiece that He is working out to be His hands and feet on this earth. The word hagios, the second most time it's used, is used for the saints again. I'll read you a little bit of Ephesians just to give you a taste of it for when you read it this week. Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. In love He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and will, to the praise of His glorious name, which He has freely given to us in the one He loves, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin, and according with the riches of God's grace that He lavishly poured out upon us. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. We've got two uses of Haggios already with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption, later in that chapter, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. God is holy. You are holy if you've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, if you have faith in Him. And as you've read James, you know that James says that faith without actions or deeds is dead. Because if you believe something, you're going to do something with that belief. 
If you believe that you're drowning and someone throws you a life preserver, you're not going to say, it's sitting beside of me, I'll be fine. You're going to grab a hold of it and you're not going to let it go from your grip. What do you think about Jesus' sacrifice? Have you been reading Hebrews? Do you understand this? That Christ is our priest and king? That he is greater than anything else than you can imagine? Is he greater to you? And this world is going to try its best to take you away from that salvation or let you never achieve that salvation. But are you holding firmly? Are you firmly anchored to that faith in Jesus Christ? Do you see the hope that you have? And is Jesus becoming greater and greater and greater in your life? Your homework, if you didn't read it last week, you might write it down and read it this week, was Exodus 25 to 29 because it explains a lot of this. Okay? If you didn't read it, again, it's Exodus 25 to 29, and I'll give you more homework tonight. If you didn't look at your, or today, if you didn't look at your handout, look at it, study it. It'll give you a glimpse again of what the Hebrews already had some understanding of, of this sacrificial system. Why the sacrificial system? Because we won't keep the law. We are wretched and sinful, naked and blind, miserable without hope. And God makes atonement for our sin. But the blood of bulls and goats can never cleanse us from our unrighteousness. So therefore Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, came and was slain for us. The scriptures this morning should have given you a little bit of, of a clue of that throne room in heaven, not a, the copy out in the wilderness, or not the great temple that Solomon built. Mark read a little bit from it. And I'm going to read you Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5. It's not long. And I want you to listen to what's there. This is the throne room in heaven where Jesus sat down at the right hand of God. Revelation chapter 4, After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. Open in heaven. Wow. And the voice I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there, there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were the 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their head. From the throne, from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumbles, and peals of thunder. In front of the thr throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying angel. Each of these four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around. Un even under its wings, day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I told you before, when you read something from the New Testament, that this quote from the Old Testament, go read it. That's from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. And you need to have an understanding of what's going on in Isaiah because the people of Israel were stiff-necked, rebellious people. And Isaiah was called to cry out to them to repent and turn to God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. When the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to Him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for You created all things. And by Your will they were created and have their being." Uh, it should remind you a little bit of the tabernacle and all of its glory. Maybe it reminds you some of the temple and all of its glory. And if you could remember the New Testament, which we'll be reading Matthew later in April, that the disciples even said something about the glory of the temple, all the, everything that was there. And Jesus said, not one stone here won't be turned upside down. It will all be destroyed. Because Jesus came once and for all. He said, it is finished on the cross. There is no need for that sacrificial system. But Paul also writes, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable act of service. You are to be that sacrifice and follow in Jesus' footsteps. 
If a man will come to follow me, he will deny himself, take up his cross, and follow after me. And if anyone doesn't do that, Jesus all goes on, goes on to say, he is not worthy of me. It's Revelation chapter 5. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside of it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. But then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The Lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden, golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased for God, for God, persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Are you giving it to Him? Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. Two chapters we just read. It took about seven minutes, give or take. I didn't time it. And I know some of you aren't reading through this because you don't have time during the day. You miss a day because you don't have time. It took seven minutes to read two chapters. And when we read those two chapters, it should have echoed the words of Hebrews. It should have re echoed the words of Exodus that we're reading. We should have seen that, wow, God gave up heaven to come down and take my place, that place of shame and torment on the cross, separated from God the Father. Never had that been done. Nothing like that whatsoever. He took all of my blame, all of my sin, the sin of everyone that has ever lived and ever will live upon His shoulders. He took the wrath of God that we deserve upon Himself. And He said, it is finished. Will you follow me? Will you believe in me? I lay down my life for my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. One day He will separate the sheep from the goat. So he will return. He is in heaven interceding for us. He is our mediator in heaven. And the Holy Spirit lives inside of us interceding for us. Wow, worthy is the Lamb. Holy, holy, holy. Because of our sin, sin, sin. Now if you understood and you read any about the tabernacle, it was a magnificent place. All the wealth of Egypt came out with the Israelites and they brought their offerings in freely to build this tabernacle. And then picture this, because it doesn't tell you this from Scripture, but as you read it and understand it, you picture it. All of that beauty was stained with blood everywhere. Blood, blood, blood to make you holy, holy, holy. But the blood of bulls and goats cannot make you holy. It took a man's blood who came flesh and blood, lived, faced everything that you face, so the troubles that you're facing in this world, everything else, they've been taken care of. Jesus Christ has been through anything and everything you could possibly go through, and He feels your pain. And He gave up His life so you wouldn't have to feel eternal pain and separation from God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. To understand Hebrews, you have to understand Revelation. You have to understand Exodus. you got some homework coming up with Leviticus chapter 16. I'll tell you again in a little bit because that talks about the Day of Atonement. 
that one day out of the year that the high priest could go in and make those sacrifices. But let's look a little bit more about it first. We left off with Hebrews chapter 7. So I'm going to pick up at the beginning of chapter 7, and we're going to cover Hebrews chapter 8 and 9 today. Two chapters. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22. Because of this oath, this oath that God made, because an oath is binding, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. The old covenant was wonderful. A, a person in the world won't understand the sacrificial system and stuff, but you should see how beautiful that is. And the Israelites recognized their sin, and they recognized that they needed to give something up. So they gave the best of their flocks, right? That goes all the way back to... Uh, Adam and Eve in the garden with Cain and Abel, right? The best of their sacrifices. They brought them willingly to the Lord because they wanted to be made right because they knew that they had sinned. Okay? Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. We learned about Melchizedek who had no beginning or no end. He had no lineage. But because Jesus lives forever, he was a permanent priesthood. The Levites lived and died and lived and died and lived and died. The priests came and went. We even read that, that Aaron, uh, Aaron's two sons were consumed for burning strange fire. You better do it the way that God says to do it. Shouldn't you follow Jesus' voice the way he says? Shouldn't you even love your enemies? <laughs> we find it hard to love our neighbors. Verse 25, Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for, first for our own sins and then for, the, for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for sins once and for all, Jesus did, when he offered himself. For the law appointed as high priests men in all their weakness, but the oath which came after the law appointed the Son, who had been made perfect forever. Hebrews chapter 8. Now the main point of what we are saying is this. So when you see something like that, make sure you understand it. The main point of everything that the author has said up to this point is Jesus is greater. The old system was good and Hebrews would have still tried to rely on the, relied on the law and the, the uh, festivals and everything else. They would try to rely on their own righteousness, who they were. They, were. they were children of Abraham. But Jesus told them clearly they weren't children of Abraham unless they had the faith of Abraham. And you go on to read that in Hebrews chapter 11. The main point is Jesus is our high priest. We do have such a high priest. He's the one who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, which you re read about in Revelation, and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not mere human beings. Verse 3, Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer himself. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already priests who offer gifts prescribed by the law, those with lineage, the Levites, and even Melchizedek, one without lineage. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. That is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown on the mountain. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is a mediator. It is superior. Jesus is a superior priest. Jesus is the mediator of a superior covenant. We'll explain a little bit more about the minute in a minute, but covenants have two parties agreeing. Some are conditional, some are unconditional. The Mosaic covenant said, here's all of God's laws, and the children of Israel said, we will obey. And the Lord God said, if you don't obey, and you can go read the rest, okay? He is superior, I'll start back in verse 6. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is, me he is mediator is superior to the old one. Since the new covenant is established on better promises, for if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. 
It will not be like the first covenant. It will be unconditional. I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant. I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. Is Jesus' laws, is His love, is His passion written on your heart? Because if it is, as you're reading in James, there's no way that you can't have deeds. There's no way that if I love Sherry... Hey, by the way, this is my wife here. I don't know if you've met her. It's not just Alan, it's Alan and Sherry. She is my wife, my love, my friend, the mother of my children, the nana to my grandkids, my mate, my companion, the one that completes me, the one that I will walk through this earth with until we are not walking on this earth anymore. We have a covenant called a marriage covenant. And she helps me walk this life of faith together. I love her. So even though when times are bad or whatever else, I'm beside her. I might have to get knocked in the head every once in a while to realize and show it. But Jesus is so much greater than her. And she knows that's not a cut in any way. Because that's what she admires. Is that I follow after God. Because how could I not knowing what Jesus Christ has done for me. He is so much greater. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. There aren't any conditions here. I will be their God. They will be my people. Nothing can separate me from God and His love if I have faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 11, no longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. There is no difference. Men, women, poor, rich, nothing else. You don't even need a teacher because the Holy Spirit and the Word is your teacher. You don't need me. You can study everything that I've studied this week. You can pray like I've prayed and follow after Jesus and let Him reveal to you even more truth than He ever revealed to me. But are you spending time with Him? Are you feeding off of the bread of life? Or do you spend more time eating physical food? I know I'm guilty of that many times. I've started with my exercise for my body to make sure that I read the Bible during that time. And I don't have my phone right here with me, but it's so neat. I can sit it right there on the little pad of the elliptical and put the Bible on there and hit play. And it's reading to me out loud as I'm reading it. And like last night, I said, okay, I hadn't made James yet because I've been studying Hebrews. I'm going to get caught up and do James 1, 2, 3. Then after chapter 3, I'm like, mm, I've got to go on to chapter 4 because I know that it's only five chapters. And then I have to do chapter 5. I did my elliptical last night that I never did before because I'm doing my body, but I'm doing my soul and my mind and studying God's Word and making sure I do that at the same time. I used to watch television during that time or listen to music. Huh. That's really going to mount up to something in the long run, isn't it? But now I make sure that my Bible's sitting right there on that little holder and I read it and study it as I'm doing my body because you know what? My spirit is so much more important than this earthly tent. It's just a copy, what a reflection of what I'm going to be like in heaven, just like the tabernacle was a reflection and even the temple in all of Solomon's glory was what the throne room in heaven will be like. What verse am I on? Got it. Verse 12. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. The earthly priest could not do that even on the Day of Atonement. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Now that means when Jesus returns for good, but it also disappeared in A.D. 70 when the temple was destroyed. There is no temple system with sacrifices like there was then. There are still the Day of Atonement and, and festivals, and there are still some people that practice sacrifices, but nothing like it was before. 
You brought a sin offering daily to the Lord. Maybe you never thought about that. Can you imagine the amount of blood? Most of you guys hunt here. If you kill a bull, there's a good bit of blood that's poured out. If you kill a goat, a fair amount of blood that's poured out. We're talking about millions of people's sins for a couple thousand years. Can you imagine how much blood that is? I tried and tried and tried to find somewhere that figured it out. You know, because like probabilities of Jesus, they, they tell you about that and you could cover the state of Texas with quarters. I couldn't find anything for the blood. But can you imagine the amount of blood? You may not know it, but in Jesus' day and even before that in the temple, they had drainage systems for the blood that was in the temple. Drainage systems for the amount of blood that went in there. And with blood, there's a smell too, isn't there? There's a smell of death. Because see, God gave us life, created in His image to live for His glory and His honor, to worship Him. And we disobeyed, and that requires death, blood. Thank goodness Jesus came. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty because He has covered our sins, sins, sins. Covenant. Do you know what that means? The Hebrew word is bereath. It means, it's broken down two words. The Hebrew words, and Walt can explain a lot more than I can explain. Each letter has a meaning, and then you put them together, and sometimes there's compound words and everything else. But it's a com combination of two words, bara and karat. That means meat and cut because it involved the lifeblood of an animal. An animal had to be killed. Just like when Adam and Eve discovered they were naked in their shame in the garden, God killed the animal to clothe them. Blood was shed to cover them. In a covenant, and if you go on, if you read, if you read Genesis chapter 14 last week, I'm pretty sure I'm on the right chapter. If you read Genesis chapter 15, you'll see right after we saw that Melchizedek guy, we'll, we would read about the covenant that Abraham had. Now, or Abram had. We already had the promises God had, but in the chapter 15 you understand what a covenant is because literally Abraham took two animals and divided them apart, more than just two animals if you read it. And God, when Abraham, Abram fell asleep, his presence passed through because he made a covenant. What a covenant says is I killed this animal. He lost his life. And I divide the parts and then I walk through if I agree to this covenant and if it's uh, you're agreeing to this covenant, then you walk through. What that's saying literally is, if you break this covenant, I'm pointing to Sherry here because of marriage covenant, okay? You better believe this. <laughs> then you can do to me what I just did to that animal. That's what it literally means. That's the seriousness of it. When the mountains trembled and the smoke and everything else and the children of Israel heard the law, they said... We will obey. How much more have you been bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ? If you read in Genesis chapter 15, you'll understand a little bit more of that. But I want to explain to you a little bit, not about the Abrahamic covenant, but the Mosaic covenant, because that's what the author of Hebrews is talking about. So we'll look at a little example in Exodus chapter 19, verses 3 to 6. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine... You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. As you read the New Testament, you should see the failure of a stick neff people called the children of God. And you shouldn't point fingers at them, but it should let you realize how you were bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. How can you ever say as a Christian, I'm saved and I know it, but I'm not going to sacrifice anything. My life's not really going to show it. I'm going to live the same way I lived before. I'm not going to live any different than other people. And I'm sure not going to go out there and tell people about Jesus because there's pastors and missionaries called for that. 
You were bought with the blood of Jesus Christ, God Almighty, to be brought back to Him, to serve Him, to offer spiritual sacrifices pleasing to Him. If you don't understand that sacrificial system, it won't mean as much to you what that literally means when Paul said that. And it hurts to be a sacrifice. It's not easy. You've got to walk in step with the Spirit. You've got to let Him sanctify you through and through. You've got to say, not my will, but yours, Lord. Peter would later write this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Therefore, rid yourself of malice, and of all malice and all deceit, all hypocrisy, all envy, all slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave spiritual milk. You'll see a resemblance there to Hebrews. You crave that spiritual milk so you grow up. It's like newborn babies crave spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. I said last week, what if your, your, your age that you are in heaven because you want that 30 age old body that doesn't have all the problems that a 55 year old body has or a 65 year old body has, and I could keep going but I won't you want to remember back to that and have that but what if your body was based off your spiritual maturity you know, a lot of toddlers a lot of toddlers you are supposed to grow up in your salvation verse 3 why because now you have tasted that the Lord is good as you come to Him, the living stone rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to Him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. There it is again. Offering spiritual sacrifices. Don't miss it. You're a holy priesthood all together as a church, individually as priests, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chose, chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in Him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But those, to those who don't believe, huh, you've got a question whether I truly believe even here. The stone the builders reject has become the, the, the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. One or the other. You're either building upon Jesus, building this spiritual house, this holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices, or you're stumbling and falling down. They stumble because they what? They disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you, you're not that way. You're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Hebrews chapter 9. Now the first covenant, and we described that, it was conditional and the Israelites failed. It had regulations for worship and also for an earthly sanctuary, a tabernacle, the word is mishkan, it means dwelling place. I've said it before, so I'm not going to go in that, depth, that much depth now. But it's so that God can dwell with His people. A tabernacle was set up. In its first room were a lampstand. And I'll be thinking about what we read in Revelation. And the table with its consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, or holy of holies, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. This ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded in the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of the, of the glory overshadowing the atonement cover. We're going to talk about atonement again in a minute. Or you might say, know it as the mercy seat. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. That's why I gave you this pamphlet. That's why I gave you the homework. So you'd have a little bit of this idea before you got to this point. Verse 6, when everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry out their ministry, regularly, daily. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that was only once a year and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people. The word atonement is Yom Kippur. You may know that it is the day of atonement or Yom Kippur. That's what it's still called. It is a covering. It means literally to cover over with tar or pitch. 
but we have to take how it's meant in this position. It's a legal covering because we see this system that's set up to cancel a legal debt. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's why Jesus' blood was poured out upon the mercy seat, the atonement cover in heaven to pay for your sins, to pardon and forgive you. What a wonderful, wonderful thing. You can meet, read more about the Day of Atonement in Leviticus chapter 16. But right now I want to give you a little background for Hebrews going to Leviticus 4. Verse 3, if the anointed priest sins, priests were fallible men, don't put them up on a pedestal, bringing guilt on the people, his sin brought guilt on the people, yes, yeah, because he's a representative for them. He must bring to the Lord a young bull, okay, we, we're seeing the system here, without defect, as a sin offering for the sin that he has committed. Well, wait a minute. We need to go back and read verse 1 and 2. The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, This is knowledge for all them. This is not just knowledge for the priests. When anyone sins, and look at the next word, unintentionally. I'm reading from NIV because I assume most of you have NIV. And does what is forbidden in any of the Lord's commandment. Anyone, everyone who sins, even unintentionally, there is no one exempt. If the, I'm dropping down to verse 13. If the whole Israelite community sins unintentionally, they are to bring a young bull, verse 14, as a sin offering. Verse 22, when a leader sins unintentionally, he is to bring the offering of a male goat, verse 23. Verse 27, if any member of the community sins unintentionally, that word has a little different meaning than member now in the church. Anyone, period. Okay? Anyone who understands that God is God. That there are not a bunch of idols out there. That there is one true God. Anyone in the community sins unintentionally and does what is forbidden in any of the Lord's commands, any of them, when they realize their guilt and the sin that they have committed, you realize that you have done something against God. No matter if it was telling a little white lie. No matter if it was as Jesus expounded, uh, murder, but if I thought anger in my heart towards somebody, then that is also murder. And we've all sinned and fall short of God's glory. When they realize their guilt and the sin that they have committed, they bring as their offering for sin that uh, they committed a female goat without defect. We've noticed a difference in the sacrifices. They are to lay hands on the head of the sin offering and slaughter it at the place of the burnt offering. Then the priest is to take some of the blood with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of a burnt offering and pour out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. Gallons upon gallons upon gallons upon gallons of blood, blood, blood for your and my sin, sin, sin. They shall remove all the fat, just as the fat is removed for the fellowship offering. And the priest shall burn it on an altar as an aroma, aroma pleasing to the Lord. In this way, the priest will make atonement for them, and they will be forgiven. But the blood of bulls and goats cannot forgive. There was a difference in the animals, in the value and cost of, of the animal, because of the, val because of the cost of the sin. The priest was more accountable. The leader was more accountable. The nation of Israel as a whole was more accountable. Not any better than, nothing else. It's just to show you the, the difference then. The bigger your commitment to God, the bigger your sin is known to others, and the bigger the cost that God associated with it. That's his system. Okay? And blood or life is required because sin is the opposite of life. It is death. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 7, that's where we left off. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that was only once a year, and never without blood. That's why I went back to Leviticus 4, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people. And I stopped right there. I didn't give you the next words, because you'd say, well, maybe that's not there in Leviticus, but it is. The sins that him and himself had committed in ignorance. I don't know about you, but I'm sure I've committed, and I know from time to time it's revealed to me, many sins of ignorance. That's why in the New Testament you read that if it's not building up words, don't even say them. 
Because that little statement that you said that you didn't mean any harm by might well have harmed somebody else. And if it did harm them, then guess what? It was sin, even though you never intended it to be. And it's better to abstain from any appearance of sin or to even say anything that's not edifying to the building up. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way to the most holy place had not been disclosed. As long as the first tabernacle was still functioning, this is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifice being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. It's the first time you see that word. That's where repentance comes in. That I have knowledge of my sin and my debt to God, what I've done, knowledge of His holiness and what He's done for me, and it has to change my heart so that God can write the laws on my heart, which has to change to the way I live, breathe, think, function, everything. That I am a new creation in Christ. I have to crave spiritual milk so I can grow up because who doesn't want to grow up? Verse 10, they are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings which the Israelites were relying on. External regulations apply, applying until the time of new order. <clears throat> Verse 11, but when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, is not a part of creation. He did not enter by the means of bloods of go go bulls or goats or calves. He entered the most holy place once and for all by His own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonial, unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God? Verse 15, For, the reason, for this reason Christ is a mediator of a new covenant, and those who are called may receive the promised internal, eternal inheritance, now that He has died as a ransom, a payment, to set them for free for the sins committed under the first covenant, which could only address unintentional sin. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it, because a will is in force only when someone has died. It never takes effect while the one who made is living. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every command of the law, all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and the branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll, the law, and all the people. Not only were the, everything in the tabernacle sprinkled with blood, but the people had blood put on them to remind them. Verse 20, he said, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. Verse 21, in the same way he sprinkled with blood the tabernacle and everything used in the ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Debbie quoted that verse this morning. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself. Now to appear for us in God's presence, be doing His priestly role. Nor did He enter heaven to offer Himself again and again the way high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood that is not His own. Other Christ, otherwise Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But He appeared once and for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice Himself, just as people are destined to die once and after that face judgment. So Christ the sacrifice wants to take away the sins of many, and He will appear a second time, not to bear sin, not as priest, but to bring salvation to those who eagerly wait Him as King. Now if you have NIV, it doesn't say eagerly wait. It says just waiting for Him. 
There's where I tell you, and other pastors will disagree, I tell you to read different translations, okay? So that you can understand that better. Because if you take words again and you don't understand them, and you're taking a literal <coughs> definition word Bible, and you should have one of those, you're not going to understand it as much. If you read Leviticus 16, it talks about the anguish of soul. I think I have the term right. And that means... Not just fasting. Most of your translations are going to say fasting. Because fasting is where you give up something, but it's giving up everything so that it anguishes your very soul. That Hebrews 4.12 where that word divides to your soul and spirit, which I don't even understand, so that I'm torn in two with my sin and God's holiness and what Jesus Christ has done for me. Your homework, Okay? Pamphlet. So if you didn't get the pamphlet, come get it. If you didn't read Genesis chapter 25 through 29, read them. Exodus 25, 29. Sorry, I did that with Sherry and messed her up. And she said, why were we supposed to read this? <laughs> Leviticus chapter 16, it tells you about the Day of Atonement. Psalm 40 and Psalm 51. When you get to Psalm 51, I want you to contemplate your intentional sin. Oh yeah, I hit that one, didn't I? Your intentional sin. There was a man named David. He was the king of Israel. He wasn't a priest because he couldn't be a priest. We have understood all that. And he committed an atrocious sin, did he not? And he should have realized it. He didn't realize it. When the priest came to him and pointed it out, he realized it. And he said, have mercy on me, O God. Why did he say that? Because there was no sacrifice available to pay the penalty of his intentional sin. And his conscience was seared. And all he could do was fall on God's mercy. Wow. What Jesus Christ has done for us. If you can even begin to fathom any of that, then it should bring you to your knees. We're going to take communion today. I think I have enough cups. <laughs> If you have a small child, you might want to share a cup, but there's plenty of bread. I got 50, and I haven't done exact head count, but we're pretty close. Here's how we're going to do this. Can I get some volunteers to distribute? Communion? Okay, one, two, three. I need another one. Stand up. Come on, Walt. I saw Walt moving. I called him out. We're going to distribute the elements. Then I'll let you know when we're going to partake of the elements. Come on, Walt. I'm going to bless them, and then I'll tell you to distribute them in just a minute because it's a little different than we've done. Father in heaven, we do thank you. We do this in remembrance of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Not just remembering that he died on the cross, not remembering that he was a good person or a prophet or a teacher, but that he was our priest, is our priest, that he makes intercessions for us, that he is greater than any other priest, that he has done something that no priest could ever do because of the sin that they carried with them to the cross. Jesus carried no sin. He was innocent. He gave up His innocent blood to save us. He went willing to the cross. Even though He said, Father, if this be anything that You can take from me, do it, but not my will, but Yours, O Lord. I have come to do the work that You have called me to do, to leave heaven, to come and be flesh and blood, to do the work, to finish paying the price so that people who believe in my, what I have done will have atonement and forgiveness for sin once and for all. We thank you for his body that was given for us and his blood that was given for us. We know these are just representatives of what the fact is that Jesus Christ did for us. But we ask your blessing upon them and as we take them today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can start distributing them. Walk instead of passing, instead of passing, just to go COVID good guidelines, walk to each person and hand them out. You've got time. Okay, instead of passing them. 
Um, I modified this a little bit, but I want to read this to you as they're passing out the elements. And remember to wait till we partake. Is this horror? Sherry can't say that word good. She goes, horror. Sorry. Sorry, I love you, sweetheart. <laughs> There's certain words I can't say, and one of them that I always have trouble with about prostate. <laughs> or pro okay. Or yeah, see, I can take it. I can dish it out and take it. Is this horror or beauty? Okay? There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. You might recognize that, and we're going to play that during communion here in a minute. And sinners plunge beneath that flood. You ever thought about it that way? They lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains. All sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Make sure you take for yourselves too. Okay, bread over here. Farley. If you don't get either element, raise your hand. Okay. The Old Testament sacrificial system was a copy and it pointed to the true sacrifice of Jesus Christ for atonement of our sins. The Old Testament system sacrificed a lot of animals for a lot of sins. Way over a million sacrifices potentially in one day in the, in the Hebrew camp. 